Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, um, I want to talk quickly about scaling cluster operators beyond boundaries. That is, you know, single cluster boundary, aka we call it as a multi-cluster controller. So this is more about TikTok's journey of how we implemented multi-cluster controllers, um, and also it's like why we ended up building multi-cluster controllers in the first place. So by the way, my name is Naveen, Naveen Mogulla. I'm a tech lead with TikTok at Edge Platform team. So let me give a little bit of introduction about my team first. Uh, so I'm part of the Edge Platform team, and we are responsible for infrastructure for all the Edge use cases. That is, you know, CDN type of workloads, live streaming, real-time communications, upload, et cetera, et cetera. So we basically decided to use Kubernetes uh, on all of these, we call it as a point of presence. Uh, we have around 250 to 300 global clusters. So we use these tiny data centers and we build Kubernetes on top of it and we provide it as a platform to internal engineering teams. Uh, that is TikTok CDN team, TikTok live you know, upload team and all of those guys. So um, there are around 250 to 300 Kubernetes clusters across the globe. Whenever I say globe, uh, consider in this presentation it has a globe minus China. It's non-China um, in a TikTok. So and the important thing here I want to just talk about is these are edge clusters, not main data center clusters. So some of these clusters are very tiny. Like it could be as minimum as like 10 Q in a nodes to all the way to, you know, we have around 600, 700 nodes. So uh, all of these are Kubernetes clusters, you know, somewhere between like I've I seen 10 node clusters and we have seen multiple 600 nodes based on the demand, you know, based on the popularity of geolocations or whatnot. So, all these um, clusters have a variety range of nodes. And uh, obviously, uh, the other one, uh, you know, it's a predominantly, um, we are in bare metal infrastructure business rather than the cloud business because of, you know, obvious reasons. Uh, TikTok bandwidth, uh, you know, uh, transaction volume or whatnot. So it's going to be way too expensive in the cloud. So we have our own point of presence across the globe. But we started exploring the cloud wherever is possible. Uh, you know, we have presence in GKE, we have presence in EKS, OK, uh, you know, uh, across all these places. Um, or in high level, we have the, you know, control plane and data plane clusters. So data plane is more like where the actual um, user workloads, like the, when I say user, it's more like TikTok, CDN team, or you know, other teams. The workloads are deployed on these data plane clusters. And control plane is where, you know, our platform services uh, sits, and we use that to manage all these data plane clusters. Um, one other thing I want to talk about is like, obviously, like any other platform team, um, we just not install these vanilla Kubernetes clusters across the globe, you know, across these locations and provide it as a platform, but uh, we obviously provide some essential features like logs, metrics, config, secret management, you know, all of these essential features. So, um, yeah, so platform features like metrics, config, secret management, and we have you know internal uh, services as well. We provide it as a platform. Like anytime you create anything, probably creates an incident. You know, all of these platform features are provided by our team. I want to talk a little bit about you know since we're talking about the operators, we want to talk a little bit about the operators here. So. Um, one of them is, like I said, whenever it's not just a Kubernetes, uh, you know, vanilla clusters, we're going to provide these platform features, which basically, at the end of the day, those features gets turned into operators like logs, metrics, you know, whatever, all of these things. And operators basically play a key role uh, for platform team to, uh, platform team to provide these uh, features. Uh, obviously, if, it, if it's already available in open source, we basically just reuse those things. We're not going to reinvent any, you know, anything. Instead, we just, uh, you know, take the open source components as is, and we deploy it across all these clusters. Um, 
Obviously, in the last two, three years, because of the TikTok growth of WordNet, so we have seen a lot of, um, you know, more and more platform feature requests came in from the, you know, user teams, and obviously our team also grew. And anytime a platform feature comes in, that basically turns into an operator. So more and more operators, and the need of more operators basically started increasing. Um, the other one uh, is complex workflow. So whenever you want to deploy this operator across these 300 clusters, you know, you're going to have to deal with go ahead and create the namespaces, resource quota, uh, network policies, and you know, if you're using GitOps to deploy these things, you're probably dealing with customization. You're basically adding more and more overlays or whatnot to, you know, for each and every specific cluster to deploy this operators uh, into Kubernetes cluster. So uh, another thing, if you're not into edge ecosystem, so I've been in the Kubernetes ecosystem for the last five or six years before TikTok. You know, I was mainly working on the main data center ones where, you know, you may have you know, ten or fifteen clusters with you know ten thousand nodes or fifteen thousand nodes. Mostly, if you're in cloud provider, you're probably using ASG, which uh, cluster, cluster auto scaler, which can scale up, scale down. But in our case. You know, like I said, we, we are in more of a physical uh, infrastructure business. This basically means that anytime you need extra you know, resources like a server, you know, a couple of more servers, it's not just a straightforward thing. It could take sometimes days, weeks, sometimes months, you know, depends on the logistics. So it's, there is a limited resources constraint in, um, you know, edge, edge ecosystem. Um, Obviously, uh, coming to the platform features, so anytime we get more and more platform features, that basically means that we're turning into operators and we have to deploy these operators, which basically comes up with the cost. It's already a tiny resources, a resource constraint ecosystem and tiny clusters, and you're going to have to deploy your edge, uh, you know, your operators on these clusters, and it, it's going to take up some resources. And on top of it, we have you know, some pretty good requirements, something like real-time processing, where based on the response times on these edge clusters, let's say you have two or three different pops in the same geolocation, and one of the pop is probably responding within two milliseconds versus the other one is like three milliseconds. So the routing team, GTM team, uses that information to take the you know, uh, real-time decisions in terms of the routing for instead of pop one, it probably goes to pop two. So for any of these things, you are probably adding more and more operators and it taking more and more resources on top of it. So the balancing act is like there are tiny clusters. A lot of these application teams want as many resources as possible on these tiny 10 or 15 or 100 nodes. On top of it, you are getting more and more platform uh, feature requests as well. So you're going to have to make some balance where, you know, at some point of time we, were, we used to say like, hey, 20% of these resources are, are reserved for platform team because we have a lot of these platform feature requests are coming and we have to sell. And it, it's probably not going to go well with all the application teams because of obvious reasons. They want to have more and more resources so that they could serve a little bit more in these edge locations and uh, you know, generate the revenue. Versus, uh, you know, we have our own reasons like, hey, you want more features? It, it is going to cost some resources. So, in, like, I think I kind of, uh, you know, summarized this thing in the previous chat, uh, you know, previous thing. So, before multi-cluster controllers, whenever the request comes in to us you know, as a new feature, we basically convert that as, a, you know, hey, okay, we're going to build the operator for these kind of stuff, so we build the operators. And the traditional approach is like, you know, use QBuilder, create an operator, and go ahead and uh, create these namespaces, resource quota, and whatnot across all these 250 or uh, 300 clusters and start deploying those things. But we... More than, you know, a lot of the times we run into these issues where some of these clusters are completely full. Like, the, there's no capacity in some of these clusters. 
and uh, you know a lot of these clusters may be reserved by you know CDN team or you know whatever the application teams, right? So they reserve this entire capacity, and even today. Um, you're gonna get into this situation where like, you know, hey, you reserved 500 core CPU, 1,000 core CPU, but you're using maybe 200 core or 300 core CPU. That problem is not specific to our team and not specific to TikTok. I guess, I, you know, um, even in my previous place as well, it's the same thing, you know, I was talking to cloud providers yesterday, you know, uh, you know, AWS folks as well as GCP, they were also saying thing, hey, we have seen this trend of where people, uh, utilization is always less than 20 or 25%. So this option is gonna be always there where we are gonna work with the end users and trying to reclaim some of the resources to deploy platform features. That's, was there, that's, that is there today as well, that's gonna be there tomorrow as well. We're gonna to have to continuously work with these guys to you know, um, you know, efficiently use these underlying resources. But as an engineering point of view, from our point of view, what we want to do is like, okay, so for platform features or operators whenever you want to deploy it, you obviously on the resources side we can work with those guys but is there any other opportunities where we could improve so that we don't have to consume resources in the edge clusters so that's where we went to you know whiteboard and started looking at up you know what we are using cube builder as a framework every time when we create in a controller so why don't we just take a closer look at cube builder and see what we can do. If, there, if there's any opportunities out there where we could improve, you know, uh, to not to utilize so many resources across all these edge clusters. So if you look at on the left side, you probably, you know, most of you might be aware of this architecture diagram because it's been there in the Cube Builder book for, you know, three or four or five years. So in high level, I think I simplified it on the right side. What do you see is, you have one manager, which is basically provides the common functionalities, such as client, Kubernetes client, and you have the cache, that's more like you know, informers. And you, you have controllers where you basically register with manager, and uh, it's not one-to-one -one, uh, relationship, one manager, one controller, but you can have multiple controllers in, in a, and register it with a manager. So. If you look at in high level, it's, it's pretty much basically anytime you're creating a controller for specific to a particular resource, you basically register with informer, which is nothing but cache there. It builds the cache, and once you get the cache, you basically, uh, controller takes those, uh, you know, filters out those events based on predicate or whatever you want, puts it in the queue, uh, a worker item queue, and the reconciler is gonna pick up those uh, items one by one, from the queue and uh, you know, process it. So, in high level, what we have seen when we started looking at it is like, okay, so there's, the problem is with the manager where the manager is the one which is picking up the cube config from in cluster and able to talk to API server. So the boundary is one single cluster. So, why don't we see if we can expand that option. Instead of having man manager aware of one single cluster, why don't we see if we can make manager aware of multiple clusters? So that's where, you know, what we, have, you know, what we started doing is, if you look up on the right side, we first started with the, you know, just a diagram, right? Okay, what can we do? Let's bulk up the manager and have multiple clients so that each and every client can talk to, you know, res uh, respect to API server, and you can have, a, you know, multiple caches as well, and the same way, you know, a controller basically gonna register with this uh, manager, and, um, you know, whenever controller wants to talk to cluster one API server, it goes and talk to client one that basically talks to API server. So and so, in theoretically, it was very good. Okay, so it was easy, like, you know what, let's, let's bulk up the manager to expand it so that it can talk to more than one single cluster. So, what we have done is we started taking 
QBuilder as a reference, you know, QBuilder code as a reference, and then we started enhancing the packages inside the QBuilder. So you have a you know, controller component, you have a, a cluster component, reconciler, you know, all of these packages inside the QBuilder reference. So we started modifying, you know, if you look at the uh, QBuilder code, you will see that, you know, the structs, uh, the interface is basically accepting only one client or only one cluster. So we tried to like, you know what, let's just make it to accept array of clusters, array of clients, array of caches. So when we started doing that, it was all good, but we just went into the deep rabbit hole where we had to change each and every component because if you're touching the top layer, the, you know, when you change the signature of the functions in the top layer, you have to change the child as well because this is the one which is calling the top layers. So we ended up writing this beautiful code, or the complex code, however you call it, um, and uh, you know, changed every component of the, uh, you know, all of these packages. So, the way we done is obviously like you know on the left side, left hand side you can see that implement manager to be aware of more than one single cluster and implement controllers to be aware of multiple caches and clients and start multiple caches instead of single cache and you know start all the controllers at the end so that's more like the sequence of doing the things so but in overall the idea is Ha instead of having these distributed operators installed across all the clusters, why don't we do one single operator in the central cluster where we deployed in the cloud and we have this flexibility of resources? So why don't we do that in the central hub and let's see if it can do what it's supposed to do in all the clusters. So that's the idea, and we started working on it, and uh, you know, after a good amount of uh, you know, code, uh, we were able to get to a stage where you know, it worked. It started saying like, you know, we have, you know, when we started doing in a lower environments, it was able to handle the things for the you know, 20 or 25 different clusters. Uh, whatever you want to do it in one single cluster, you, you know, it was able to watch the events uh, across all these clusters and start uh, you know, ma uh, manipulating the changes or whatever you wanted to do for that particular cluster. So in high level, we went from distributed operators deploying across all the clusters creating namespaces, working with other people, to one single operator in the central cluster and deploy it so that it can actually access all the clusters and it can do list and watch across all these clusters and perform the reconciliation or whatever it needs to be done. So it definitely helped in terms of the deployment issues for us. I definitely helped in terms of the troubleshooting where, you know, in edge world when you have 300 clusters, if one of the cluster is down, you gotta go and, you know, get into that single cluster, figure out what's happening in that specific controller. You know, there's a lot of specific things, right? I mean, networking issues or whatnot. So troubleshooting also helped uh, completely centralized into one single place. So that also helped for us. Um, and like I said, we don't have to create namespaces, resources, or any of these things on, across all the clusters, so that basically simplified, and everybody loved it. But, but, during the implementation, so every time I create a PR, every time I create a you know, PR, we used to have lots of lots of discussions and lots of lots of comments on the uh, PR. And that's for obvious good reasons, because all of these engineers as well, top class, but none of them are exposed to the, the underlying um, you know, libraries itself, right? Not many people are aware of controller runtime because that's how much QBuilder and all of these community is working towards to hide all of these complexities under the rug so that people can just start writing controllers using these frameworks. So whenever I started writing the PRs, you know, building, the, you know, uh, creating the PRs, and we used to have a lot of these conversations, so I had to explain that, okay, so-and-so, so-and-so. So that's when it hit us, like, okay, 
the solution works, but this is not going to be scalable because now because of this one single reason where in a centralized operator, I need to make sure all of my engineers, all of the team need to aware of underlying um, you know, libraries and all of this stuff. So, and also obviously we, you know, because we were growing uh, a lot uh, during that time, uh, new, new engineers were like, hey, what is this? It's, it's taking a lot of time for them to onboard and adapt to this new, frame, you know, new uh, multi-cluster controllers, whatever we implemented from the scratch. So, uh, like I said, uh, you know, community efforts, community is working hard to hide these, you know, complexities so that people can write multiple controllers or, you know, lots of controllers. But whatever the approach we have taken, it actually took it in a completely opposite direction where, you know, people need to now understand what is controller, what is reconciler, what is worker item on queue, what is caches, what is, you know, all of these things on, like, uh, you know, library items. So, um, balancing act. Okay, the concept works because it helped us not to have distributed operators, instead one single operator is doing what it's supposed to do it across all the clusters. It reduced the resource issues for us because we don't have to go and talk to four or five different teams like, hey, you reserved more resources, can you give us a little bit more? Uh, can you give us so that we can deploy in a platform features? Um, but also, um, you, you know, the, on the other side is it's complex. The complexity actually got increased compared to our previous operators, whatever we used to write. So what we want to do is the balancing act is like, okay, I want to use the concept, the centralized control plane concept, uh, having one single operator and one single centralized cluster. But try to see, write the code in a way that it's closer to widely known frameworks, whether it's a queue builder or, uh, or whether it's an operator SDK, whatever, the, you know, widely known operators, right? So that's basically what we realized from this, but also, like, uh, you know, the last point is more like people can write uh, our people can solve the problem many different ways, but at least the way um, our culture, uh, you know, in the team is more like you basically code familiarity is more important than writing some complex code and just be happy that, hey, I solved this problem. You want as many people in your team as possible understands your code so that they can also you know, take it forward. You're not going to be there forever. So uh, someone else has to, you know, uh, you know, maintain that code at some point of time. So for that particular reason, we basically ended up going back to whiteboard again, scratch entire thing, and start doing this thing. Like, if you look at these diagram, whatever you see on this thing, it's literally from the very first queue builder, um, you know, slide, where you have one manager, you have controllers. So each and every manager is basically dedicated to one specific cluster. So instead of having one single manager bulking up and making it aware of all the clusters, we changed it to, you know what, forget about it, let's just do cluster specific managers. Let it have its own manager so that you're not changing anything in the queue builder framework or any of these things, but rather you're introducing something on top of it that is nothing but we introduce something called multi-cluster manager. And the multi-cluster manager's responsibility is to make sure the, you know, it brings up the managers and it shuts down the manager whenever it needs. So in high level, each cluster has its own spe cluster specific uh, manager. Add the controllers to all the you know, uh, cluster specific manager and then uh, adds those into multi-cluster manager, and multi-cluster manager takes over in terms of um, manager lifecycle events. All right, so yeah, we have, it's pretty much what I was talking about in you know, a multiple manager instead of one single manager, and uh, um, there's no changes, no underlying changes. Whatever you see, reconciler, however you create it in Kube Builder, literally the same way the new, you know, we can start 
using the same reconciler and create these things. So there's not much, nothing changed from that point of view, except few, you know, this Go specific function, you know, Golang related stuff, nothing related to the, the domain, uh, the controller runtime or any of those library related stuff. So uh, uh, other thing, which is important is if you look back here, so the controllers are being added to cluster specific managers. So the reconciler, you have, you're gonna write one single reconciler class, and that needs to be aware of what cluster it's actually working on. So we basically introduced one extra you know, field where we basically provide that the cluster name. So it now at the reconciler, it knows which cluster it's actually working on. And it basically, if, for whatever the reason, if you want to have a specific logic for a specific cluster, so now the reconciler now has the access to the cluster name and you, you can, you know, write the code according to that particular cluster. So in high level, I don't know if you can see it, uh, but in high level, this is on the left hand side, sample cube builder, right? Whenever you use cube builder to create any controller, what do you do? This is more like a main.go. If you look at it, you create the manager, right, on the top, and then you add the controllers to that particular manager and start the manager. If you look at on the right hand side, that's our approach where multi-cluster controllers, if you look at it, it first starts a, a create a multi-cluster manager. So before that, if you look at it, it actually, instead of one single cluster to be aware of multiple clusters, you need to have multiple clusters cube config. So if you look at the you know one line before that, creating the cluster manager, what we do is we basically go and pick up the clusters information, which is, in, in our case, we use it as a secret. So you have one secret per cluster, which includes the cluster name and the cube config related to it. So during the bootstrap, we go and pick up all those secrets, and now you have the list of clusters and the cube configs related to it. And create a multi-cluster multi manager, and then if you look at in the second section, it's basically adding the controllers to cluster specific managers. So if you look at the first line, it's more like pick up the cluster specific manager in the loop and go and add the controllers. So in this example, we added two controllers. If you look at this, that's one of those is multi-cluster event where we are processing the events across all the clusters and doing some you know, uh, event related stuff. And there's a namespace reconciler where we are doing you know, a bunch of stuff related to namespace whenever the namespace comes up. But you get the point where you have a multi-cluster manager, you create it, you add the controllers to the manager, and then you start the multi-cluster manager. So it's closer to the Cube Builder framework. It's closer to um, a, you know, the Cube Builder framework, and it's a centralized operator where instead of one single cube config, you're basically handing over multiple clusters cube config. So that's how closer, uh, you know, how much we closer we got to the Cube Builder framework, and that actually helped a lot in terms of. You know, uh, the users, we, we had one intern who were writing the you know, controllers on this particular framework where it was easy for him to understand like, okay, so this is what is there in the open source documentation and this is how we can do it for the multi-cluster controllers and people are writing, you know, a, a multiple multi-cluster controllers a lot. Um, so, obviously, the other thing I wanna talk about, like for any cluster, um, it, uh, any product, any software product, um, you're gonna go. It's gonna go through lots of improvements, enhancements, and whatnot. So once we started running that for the last, you know, six months or seven months, we realized a couple of things, couple of issues. Not issues, but yeah, challenges. Let's just say. Uh, one of them is in the edge world. There's a lot of network connectivity issues more than you want it to happen, right? So a lot of the times these clusters get disconnected and uh, you know, because we started the multi-cluster controllers and one of the manager gets stuck, it's basically you know, creating the issues for that, but all the controllers in that specific manager. 
Um, but also, um, you know, like we said, you know, we are growing a lot and we are adding more and more clusters, which basically means um, uh, dynamic clusters, right? You, you know, the, whenever we are pick, whenever we are doing the during the bootstrap, we are actually picking up the clusters. But after the part gets start, if new cluster can, comes up or if one of the existing cluster goes down. We don't have a way to manage those things. So that's the another problem we had. So what we have done is in very high level, this is more of a Golang related stuff and nothing more than that. But so if you look at on the left side, so these are the secrets, right? In that particular multi-cluster controller, you, you know, people can add the secrets for specific clusters, or if you a cluster gets removed, you know, during the registration process or whatnot, we are gonna remove the secret. That basically based on the create, update, or delete event on uh, in the on the secret informer, we do those operations. If you look at those things on the right side, if it's create, you create that cluster specific manager, add the controllers, and start the manager. And for whatever the reason, if the secret gets separated, you know sometimes we actually do change the admin nodes from one side to the other side. So at that time, you need to have a different cube convict. So in that case, you literally stop the manager and do the same thing again. And if it's you know secret gets deleted, that means the cluster got deprecated or whatnot. So you just stop the manager. So this is all being done. Um, you know, uh, inside the part itself. You're not stopping the part, you're not doing any of the stuff, it's just automatically getting taken care. So, if you go back to the network connectivity issues, right? So, what we have done is we started introducing health checks. So, health check is basically every 30 seconds we're gonna ping these clusters and if there's, for whatever the reason, there's a network connectivity issue, we're gonna stop the manager. I'm gonna, we're gonna retry it. So we basically simulating more like secret update because it's a Go channel. We just basically put a message there saying that, hey, there's a you know, update happened, which basically stops the manager and then try to restart it. And until the health check ping is up to date, uh, you know, is able to talk to it, and we should be able to get it. So, so far, we have been running this for the last two years. Um, it's no issues so far, and we probably have around nine different controllers, uh, and all of these are deployed in the central clusters. We, do, uh, you know, we sa save a lot of space or resources in the edge clusters, uh, for sure. Uh, but uh, this also solved us, you know, dynamic cluster management. Whenever a new cluster comes in, you know, you don't have to restart the parts or anything. It just takes care of the things, uh, you know, automatically. All right, so um, finally, uh, what I want to uh, just talk about these things is more like resource recognition. You have to, at least in edge space, you have to understand that uh, there's a lot of um, resource constraints, especially if you are into you know, physical server infrastructure. Uh, but also, you can't just sit tight and say like, hey, there's no resources and we cannot provide more platform features. So you have to balance it. So, but also, uh, on the other hand, you can't just write, you know, uh, invent different things. It's always good to invent those things, but um, if there is a possibility to be closer to the open source related frameworks, uh, at least from my team point of view, that's our preference. Keep it closer to the open source, uh, you know, adoption so that it's easy for any new engineers uh, to understand and, you know, easy to onboard. Um, and the simplified deployment. This is the, one of those hidden benefits I cannot uh, you know, be happy about. This is more like previously it used to take multiple days for us to deploy a platform operator across all the you know, clusters because, um, like I said, you know, a lot of the times users reserve it, uh, all the uh, you know, resources, and we need to work with those guys to you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, reclaim some of these resources. So that, uh, this actually helped us completely cleaning it up. Okay, so I don't need anything. All I need is in the central management cluster, which we have control. And these are cluster, you know, uh, cloud clusters so that we can bump up the you know, resources if we need it. Um, but I also want to find, uh, you know, close it with uh, 
This is an opinionated approach. I'm not gonna say that this is gonna work for everybody, every organization. Some of these operators are probably you're writing as daemon side. You know, it has to be on the particular node. So there's no you know, going around that uh, you know, daemon set idea or whatnot. So these are um, like, you know, opinionated approach. It's, it's space, uh, you know, case by case. It may work, it may not work for your case, but this is our journey from TikTok where we had to go a little bit of out of box to um, improve the operators from one single cluster to multiple clusters. And uh, hopefully, you know, we were also uh, talking to uh, multi-cluster SIG, um, you know, team as well. And, the ho you know, hopefully once you have the cluster inventory, a, you know, Cube Builder also can adapt the, you know, newer cluster inventory to uh, start making this operator aware of multiple cluster instead of one single cluster. But obviously, you know, we are way um, far from that thing, uh, it's probably going to take one or one and a half year, but yeah, this is this is more about our approach, and that's about our you know our journey in terms of a multi-cluster controllers. Thank you. I know I probably took more time, but anybody has any questions? You know, I can yes, I can yes, we can talk about. It.